Hi everyone, welcome back to Workshop and it's repair time again and this time we've got something slightly more old school. Not my usual flavour but I really couldn't say no to a Keithley Model 225 current source. This has come from somebody that follows my channel. They asked if I'd like to have a bash at repairing this. Uh, it does have a fault, possibly a catastrophic fault, meaning that it's, uh, yep, it could be a little bit difficult to repair. So I thought, yep, I'll take a look at that. So it's a current source. So you've got the decade adjustment here at the top here with the decimal point that's shown there. And you've got the range selector switch here going from milliamps all the way through to nanoamps. And by adjusting that switch there, you'll obviously change the decimal point position there. Down on here, you've got the output selector, either standby, a negative output or a positive output. And you've got a filter switch here that basically just adds a capacitor across the main output. And you've got the compliance voltage adjust here. That's used for adjusting the voltage used to derive the current output. Because obviously if you're driving a more high impedance uh, load and you don't have enough voltage driving that load, then you're not going to achieve that current. So you've got the ability here to adjust that voltage, anything from 10 right through to 100 volts. And the limit light here will show you when you don't have enough uh, compliance voltage. PCBWay is your one-stop solution that's been expanded from their large variety of PCB prototyping solutions to 3D printing, CNC machine work and sheet metal fabrication. PCBWay also has a growing community on their site where it's become an open platform for makers to exchange and share their ideas including the PCBWay store where some of the hottest modules can be purchased. I've been using PCBWay for years for my own products. Always reliable, always quality and always on time. But before I start let's talk about blocks of rubber. As you saw there, I was using this brand new uh, block of rubber here to prop up the Keithley and uh, yep, yeah, it seems to be fit for the job. But previously I was using this here. Now a few of you have commented in the past that uh, they recognise what this is and yes it is an exhaust hanger for a car exhaust and actually it's a couple of them that I've just glued together and I've been using this for years uh, in order to prop up various devices just because it's got a couple of different orientations that you can use to prop something up but I thought we'd retire this here and I managed to find a couple of new blocks of rubber. This one here is a nice size and uh, nice shape you can get a couple of different heights out of it but I've also got this one here uh, now this one here, like the exhaust hanger rubber, does have a specific purpose outside of electronics etc. It's not been designed to prop up uh, test instruments. And I just wonder if any of you out there can recognise what this is. It does have a very, very specific purpose. And you can see it's got this corrugated effect on the top there. Otherwise it's basically clean on all the other sides. What is it? Answers in the comments below. Okay, let's take a look inside and see what we've got. Now this unit didn't come from the UK, that's why it's got this uh, weird connector here, this weird power connector here, so I will have to change that. But there is a line voltage switch on the back which allows adjustment from 2, 3, 4 I think it is down to 110 something like that so yeah the 234 will do fine but we'll take a look inside it first and see what we've got wow that's certainly old school let me reposition the camera and here we are inside the unit and straight away I can see a couple of problems just uh, let me just tilt it up here so you can see a little bit better the transformer down here is all disconnected. Now that does give me a clue back to the original emails from the supplier of this unit. It, they think there's a problem with the transformer and it's uh, disconnected in both the primary and the secondary sides there. So I will have to remove that and uh, we'll take a look and see if the transformer is intact or not. Other than that, 
I just straight away spotted this here. Let me zoom in. We've got a resistor here that is clearly uh, been broken. I'm not sure it's been uh, broken through uh, over temperature or anything like that. Um, it just looks like it. Well, yes, it is a little bit charred on that face there. It's not been charred so much on the outside, but definitely split there. So not really sure how that's happened. That's on the range selector switch there. So I will need to replace that resistor and uh, obviously give the whole thing a good going over and make sure there's no more like that. But I think first things first, let's get the transformer out and uh, let's take a look at that. Well, somebody has been in here before, not surprising given the age of the unit. So let me zoom in in a couple of points and uh, you can see what I found. And here you've got a transistor. This looks like it's been replaced, uh, but the desoldering job that was done and the subsequent resoldering job has ripped those pads off the PCB and they've just bent the transistor legs down and along the track. So, yeah, I mean, these old single sided boards, not so easy to, you know, desolder parts on them. You can rip the pads off fairly easily, but. Uh, yeah, that's not a particularly good job there and you've almost got the same again over here although the pads look to be intact but they do look to have heavily laid in the solder joints there making sure that the solder spreads a little bit along the the tracks there and they've uh, scraped away the to the copper there but yeah not the best of jobs another little sort of half bodge there looks like somebody's cut a track or broken a track between those two points there. I'm not sure what the part is uh, without flipping it over. But yeah, and they've just uh, resoldered that there. But uh, yeah, nothing that would really stop it working. But yeah, there's the transformer uh, pads there. They do look to be intact. Uh, so no problem there. They actually look like they've got an insert possibly. Or is that just a residue? No, I do think those are actually inserts used to strengthen the uh, the pads for the transformer maybe. So let's get the transformer out. It looks like it's soldered up on the bottom side there, the heads of those screws that hold on the transformer. So I will need to loosen the nuts on top side there and that will uh, free out the transformer. Okay, we've got transformer out and as you can see there are the connections there. We've got the primary side here at 1 to 4 across there. That's a secondary side, 6 and 8. And then you've got the other secondary side, the other connections for the secondary side there. And you can see that it looks like somebody's been in this before. They've uh, tried to desolder this uh, copper um, band that goes right around the transformer. So, mm, not looking good so far. <laughs> but uh, we'll take a look also got this schematic diagram here. You can see the primary side here and the secondary side here. There are two windings. Uh, one of them is a multi-tap there going away off to two bridge rectifiers because there's various uh, supplies in and around this unit here. Okay and as you can see it's starting to go back together now. And what I did was after I re-soldered up the connections to the windings is I put down a layer of epoxy which will help hold those wires in place. It's, it's still drying at the moment but it doesn't look too bad at all. So once it's dry in a second I'm going to fit the copper shield on the outside again and re-solder it back on. Okay and that's a transformer back together. A little bit of a dog's breakfast soldering up that copper uh, outer shield there, but it really heats up dead quick. So you've got to be very sparingly with the soldering iron there in order to stop any heat getting into the windings there and that top layer that I just repaired. So hence it's a little bit untidy. So let's take a look at the secondaries here and see how they actually connect to their various bridge rectifiers because there's three in total. So here's the secondary wind in here. You can see it's multi-tapped as I mentioned and you've got two bridge rectifiers. 
this bridge rectifier here is on the limits of the winding and that's used to generate a plus and minus 130 volt supply with the zero volts being this center tapped pin 9 as I've called it on the secondary winding. The other bridge rectifier is slightly closer to that center tap and therefore generates a much lower voltage. I've got it down as plus and minus V because I'm not exactly sure as yet exactly what the voltage is. It's going to be something like plus and minus 15 I reckon. Not too sure yet. And on that other secondary winding that's used to generate a plus and minus 12 they've called it on the schematic. The actual layout of the transformer is a little bit odd. You can see the primary winding here. I've shown it drawn in the 240 volt configuration with the two primary windings in series with that link there. There's that multi-tapped uh, winding here. You can see that you've got pins 6, 9, 11, 8 and 10 corresponding there. But curiously the center taps of each half of that winding there go away off to the other side of the transformer. Of course you can do that, it could go to any side. And that other winding here, this is on this side here. A little bit curious why they didn't just put this entire secondary winding on this side, but I reckon that's probably got something to do with the PCB layout. It's a single sided board, so you are limited to exactly what you can do without putting links and all sorts on the PCB. So perhaps this is more of the logical layout in order to keep the single sided board tracks better laid out. Well, that's the transformer back in place. I didn't actually video it when I had it apart, uh, mainly because I really needed to get my head right over the transformer and it was a bit troublesome trying to video it. So I just did that off camera. And look at the orientation of it compared to how it was when I received it. Yeah, it's obvious that whoever removed the transformer before just chucked it back in, put the nuts back on the screws just to hold it temporarily in place. But uh, yeah, lucky I checked it. Anyway, it wouldn't have been a problem. There's five connections at one side and six at the other, so it couldn't really go wrong. Now the next thing I'm going to do before we actually power up, I need to look at the back of the unit here. We've got this fuse holder here. No, it doesn't look like a fuse holder, but it is. The black cap's actually missing from the fuse holder. And actually, this is live, because if I just remove that, there's the fuse there, and it's just the metalized cap that goes uh, inside the plastic cap, so that's uh, a little bit dangerous. So uh, I'm going to have to change out the whole fuse holder. And we've got a couple of banana plugs next to it. This one here is missing the green shroud for the 4mm banana. So I'm just going to change out the whole thing. And because I'm changing out that one and it's got to be nice and level with the, one, the black one, I'm just going to replace them both. So I've got a couple of 4mm uh, bananas there that can just go straight in and a new fuse holder. And there we go, just quick as that, that's the two banana sockets fitted and the new fuse holder. And very luckily I didn't need to redrill any of the holes on the back panel there to fit the obviously different sized, the different shape uh, fuse holder and the bananas went straight in no problem. Well, I'm just about ready for a power up, so I'm going to hook up the AC in a second, but just a sanity check here, given that I'd had the transformer in bits, the fuse holder, everything else. Let's just make sure that we've got a good primary and no shorts to the chassis. So I've got my multimeter here hooked up across the uh, AC input here, uh, you can see at the back. Let's put it on. And yep, we're seeing 102 ohms, that will be the primary of the transformer. And I've got it selected to the 240 volt, well, 234 volt it actually says in the switch. But uh, yep, we're selected there for the UK. Okay, and we're ready for a power up. I've marked off areas in the PCB that I can measure this plus 130 volts and minus 130 volts. The plus and minus 10 volts here and as well the input to those transistors there which I don't know exactly what the voltage is going to be I would guess somewhere around plus and minus 15 to 20 volts something like that and also this plus and minus 12 that's marked down around this bridge rectifier here.
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ramp the voltage up from 0 volts AC on the input and just gradually ramp it up and measure those voltages at the same time. I need to know if this secondary and this transformer is working okay. And I should see that plus and minus 130 volts there start creeping up as I wind up that transformer, as well as the other voltages. Okay, we're ready to go. Now one thing before I start, uh, not sure if I mentioned earlier, I did replace this 18 ohm resistor with a temporary one. Uh, that was the cracked resistor. So I've marked the PCB in and around those resistors there. The easy place to pick up that plus or minus 130 and also the other voltages. So let's uh, switch it on and wind up the uh, voltage on my variable transformer very slowly and we should start to see some voltages appearing in and around there. So let me put on the power on the front of the unit first and the variable transformer and let me just dial it up. We're only at about 25 volts AC coming in. Let me test that minus 130, so minus two and a half, that's good. Plus two and a half on that 130, that's good. Let's see this plus V. Uh, we're still at positive uh, 0 0.3. How about that minus V? Ah, that's starting to go down now, that's good. Well, it does look like we've got a problem. What I'm doing now is I've turned the unit over, I'm measuring the underside of the PCB, and I'm going to measure directly across the outer taps of that secondary winding there. We should be seeing a large AC voltage given when it's rectified we're getting plus or minus 130 volts. So we should be seeing something quite large there. So I'm going to feed in 60 volts. I've not wound it all the way up to 240 yet. I'm going to feed in 60 volts and we should see something pretty big there. We should also see something across this secondary here. So let's have a look at that now. So over here, you've got these three pads. That's three legs on that transformer. That is the outer windings of that secondary, that large multi-tap secondary, and this is the center tap which is used for the zero volts. And over here we've got that other secondary winding. So let me just put back in 60 volts. I'm using my meter here to measure that. I've also got my clamp meter here hooked up measuring the AC incoming current just so I can make sure it's not being loaded up in any way, shape or form. So let me just wind up to 60 volts off camera there. Let's go across this secondary here. 4.2 volts relative to 60 volts input. Across here we should see that large secondary winding, but I'm only getting 12.8 volts, believe it or not. And that centre tap, well, I am seeing 6.6 .6 on that side. It's 6.2 on that side. So the centre tap's intact, but I'm just not seeing hardly anything at all on that secondary output. So what I'm doing now is I've removed the four diodes on that bridge rectifier that come from that uh, plus or minus 130 volt secondary tap there so that I can just measure the unloaded AC output from that secondary. Let's see if it's loaded down. I'm not so sure it will be but we'll see because there was certainly no heat in and around those uh, bridge rectifier diodes. So let me put power on. I'm only going to go to 60 volts again but if that secondary is working, we should see quite a high AC output on that secondary. Okay, and here we go. And look at that, 57.7 volts across the outer windings of that secondary. Looks like the transformer is okay. Something else is pulling the power right down on that secondary. So, looks like we've got a low impedance path 
in and around that 130 volt, that plus and minus 130 volt supply. So I've had a little probe around for a few seconds and I think I found something off the bat. Now if I go down onto the zero volts connection down here and measure, I've got my multimeter there, power's off. This is across the minus 130 volt supply, uh, 30 odd K, that's okay. How about the plus 130 volt supply? That's okay as well. But let me go across the plus 130 and the minus 130 directly across 51 ohms. That cannot be right, surely. Well, after a poke around, it didn't take long. There's a couple of TO3 mounted packages on the rear of the unit and I'm getting a low impedance, a low resistance between two pins. Now I'm not really sure what they are, they're probably a couple of transistors. I haven't even gone near them so far but disconnecting one of the wires from one of the pins I'm still getting a low resistance between two of the pins. So I, it looks like there's a problem perhaps with uh, these uh, TO3 packages in the back or at least this one anyway. So let me remove it and let's isolate it and let's see what we get. Okay and here's the transistor removed, just one of them. And let's have a look. Ah look at that! 0.9 of an ohm, wow! Yep, presume that's a transistor. I'll need to look it up and see if I can find a replacement from a stock. Well, of course, they're not TO3 packages. Uh, they're actually TO66 packages in a TO3 shroud. So I did remove it and as you saw, it's a short circuit. And I think I may have found something from a stock. It's actually a transistor, an old one that I must have removed from some piece of equipment. Uh, the original ones are a 40318, an RCA part, and I think a 2N4240, uh, a similar uh, NPN spec. The only difference with it, it's got slightly less gain. The HFE is uh, no less than 20 as opposed to 30. So hopefully that'll do and that'll get me up and running. So let's go ahead and fit it to the unit and take it from there. Well, both the transistors were shorted and very luckily I had two identical transistors that I could replace them with. So there we go, we've got the TO66 packages bolted back up. Uh, they're actually quite novel these days anyway. There's no solder connections. It's like a, a crimp on the inside that uh, these transistor legs just slide into and get a grip on the, on the crimps on the inside. And you'd basically just screw them uh, to the chassis there. And if I just now go and double check that uh, resistance across that plus and minus 130 volt supply. And look at that, 20 meg ohms now, looking good. So let me reposition again and we'll do another power up. But before I do that, look at my 18 ohm resistor that I fitted. Yeah, it's been burnt through and that'll be a consequence of those transistors being shorted and that low impedance path between the uh, plus and minus 130. So I've resoldered in another temporary 18 ohm resistor there on that range selector switch and uh, yeah, let's try again. Okay, ready for the power up. Got my voltmeter here and I'm measuring the AC input current once again just to check for any kind of high currents on the input. So let's go down on to the minus 130 volt connection. Now I have had it powered up just briefly without actually measuring anything. Just about 20 volts or so but that's why I've got a little bit of a voltage there. But let me now just screw it up off camera, I'm at 60 volts AC incoming and yes, I'm getting minus 40 volts on the minus 130 volt rail and on the plus 130, I'm getting plus 40 volts. And that's looking good so far, but will it take 240? That's a big question. 
Okay, so let's try again. This time I've zeroed the delta on the clamp meter here so I can see what's going on. So let me screw it back up to 60 volts. There we go. I've got my 40 volts and I'm basically drawing nothing uh, that this uh, clamp meter can detect on the input. So it's all looking good so far. So let me just wind it up. 120 volts. And still now we're getting 0 0.06 uh, of an amp there. 70 milliamps that's looking good 200 volts and we've got 127 volts DC excellent and I should be able to get 240 there we go 240 okay it's going a bit high 153 that's to be expected I think wind it back down to 200 and that's my 128 so it's all looking good so far so I've screwed it back down again and uh, let's try the minus 130 volt rail. Same thing. Just to be absolutely sure. Okay. 100 volts. Looking good. 240 volts minus 153. And yes, 30 milliamps on the input. Looking good. The next thing I want to do is I want to make sure that plus and minus 10 volts is okay. So let's go on to the minus 10 volt rail there. On the end of that capacitor there. And I'll just screw it up off camera. Up to 240 volts. Yes, minus 9.7. And let me find the plus 10 volt rail. That's it there. And the same thing, wind it up to 240 volts. Yes, positive 9.6, looking good. Well, so where are we? Well, it doesn't work. I'm not getting any output, but if I just switch it on, you can see I'm getting a DP position there. And uh, yeah, it does seem to do something. I'm getting the limit light flashing just as I go from standby to uh, output on, which is, which is, I think, is reasonable as it detects being out of limit on the compliance voltage there so yeah no output so we've got some more work to do but that'll be for a part two video i think we've got enough for a part one thanks for watching